Welcome to this week's edition of Special Prosecutor with Larry Klayman. I have my very good friend and colleague, Citizens Court Judge Michael Pendleton with me. We used to work together at Judicial Watch. We still work together in many ways. A really fine person. I want to get his thoughts. Uh, he's very bright and also has great insight into what's going on in the country today. A fellow conservative, a fellow Christian. Mike, uh, give us your thoughts on what's happening with regard to this investigation with regard to the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. Of course, you know, we have a history here. We still don't know for sure what was behind the assassination of Kennedy with regard to Martin Luther King. Even the King family doesn't believe that James Earl Ray did it, probably with J. Edgar Hoover. He probably lined it up. With regard to Stephen Paddock, the guy who massacred uh, hundreds, or at least tens of people and maimed and wounded hundreds in Las Vegas, the FBI went in there and his apartment in Mesquite, Nevada, took everything out. Uh, the Richard Jewell incident with regard to the Olympic bombing in Atlanta many years ago, the guy was framed. Also, two people were framed over the anthrax, and we never found out anything about that. And then, of course, there was the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. And were, were we to believe that this guy, John Hinckley, simply did it because he had a crush on Jodie Foster? Okay. So this is what we're dealing with with our government. And I believe, given the prevarication, the delay, the lying and obfuscation, even the FBI director Ray comes on and says, well, it might not have been a bullet. Maybe it was just shrapnel or something like that or, or glass. I believe it was an inside job. I, I firmly believe that. And someone inside the, it's now the Harris-Biden regime, uh, wanted this to happen by not providing adequate security, knowing that there was an Iran hit, hit squad that was sent to the United States, or worse than that, uh, maybe they were behind this guy. And of course, we know nothing about him, and we know nothing about his motive. So I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, it's, I think it's a combination of things, Larry. I, I've been uh, watching it somewhat closely, and, and uh, it seems to me that it's either gross incompetence which is very likely, you know, the government has gotten more and more incompetent as they've decided to make uh, the color of your skin, your sex, whether you're transgender or whatever, a criteria to be a part of the FBI and some of these other agencies, the quality of the service has deteriorated to the max. I, I think it's, I think it's a combination of both incompetence and wanting things to happen because they hate Trump that bad. It's so it's a little Trump derangement syndrome and a little incompetence mixed together, dangerous cocktail for, for a former president who's saying things that a lot of people don't like. In fact, they hate him to the extent that I think they're willing to let him be shot. I do believe that. And I think it's sad too also that, 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 that our agencies have gotten so incompetent that they are, they're much more interested in DEI and what the color of your skin is, not the level of competence. I think it's a travesty. And I think our agencies have gone straight downhill because of it. Well, of course, at the time that assassination, assassination attempt occurred, Biden was running for president and he was falling way behind Trump. OK, so this was one way that you could eliminate the competition. You know, as an old antitrust <laughs> lawyer, <laughs> I can tell you this is the ultimate way you eliminate competition. So. Yeah. You know, there are many questions out there. Of course, you're familiar with Freedom Watch's Citizens Grand Juries. We're looking into this. Uh, we intend to seek to find who was responsible to have them indicted, prosecuted, and then tried. Because certainly we'll never find anything out from our so-called government. We never have. And that's why I cited all these examples, you know, over the last decades of how we still don't have answers, even with regard to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. You know, and of course, uh, the Harris-Biden regime, again, I say it's the Harris-Biden regime because she's in control, never even gave Secret Service protection to Bobby Kennedy Jr. Uh, they obviously wouldn't mind him dead either, given the fact, particularly now that he's thrown his lot uh, with President Trump. But in any event, let's move on to another subject, because I think one of the great risks of the Biden presidency, and again, I don't tell people who to vote for, but if she becomes president, it's not just her. And people 
you know, or watching her on television, she's very choreographed. She's well made up. Uh, she's relatively attractive. Uh, she'd be the first woman president. Obviously, the women love that. Uh, and a lot will vote for her regardless of her political ideologist just because she's a woman. But to me, the risk is the people that she brings along with her. And we've got basically, even as of today, with who Biden brought in, essentially a freak show, you know, in, in the government and, and the White House. I mean, we've got a press secretary who looks like she should be a carnival barker in the circus. We've got Pete Buttigieg, who loves to be filmed with his male wife in a hospital bed, pretending that his male wife gave birth to two twins. I mean, a real sicko, frankly. We've got Alejandro Mayorkas, who even TSA agents, when I go through the security at airports, I asked, I asked him, I said, how can you stand looking at this guy? One African-American TSA agent told me, I try not to, you know, <laughs> and, and on and on and on, you know, Janet Yellen. I mean, it's it. it and of course, uh, the secretary of, uh, of state, you know, Anthony Blinken, who's a real disgrace. So it's going to get worse with Harris and she's going to bring in because, you know, she pandered to the left with the vice presidential pick that she made of Tim Waltz, who's essentially a communist, an overstuffed communist. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of people in there that are going to be very harmful, not just with regard to pro-life issues and, and abortion, but also to children. They're going to promote the ability of states and governments to have kids get sex change operations between, behind their parents' backs. Your thoughts on that? I don't think there's any question. We have a freak show going on now. I can't imagine it getting worse, but I think it can. I think we can have such a level of of perversion in the White House and all the various departments and, and agencies that it can definitely get worse. And I but I think to some extent, maybe that's what this country needs to get a full dose of communism and a full dose of someone like Kamala Harris and voting for someone because of their sex, their color. I mean, we've already gone through Obama, who was a disaster. First black president, even though he's only half black, but first black president. And oh, we're so wonderful. Yet he went down the communist road. He started this whole thing going. And now we have the logical extension beyond Joe Biden is Kamala Harris, who's really a communist. I mean, she she's so radically left, and Walls is just as bad. So you've got maybe this country needs a dose of what it really is. You know, I got the chance to see behind the uh, the Iron Curtain, behind the wall before the wall fell, and I got to tell you, it was misery times a hundred what we have now it can get a lot worse lines of people waiting for food it was horrendous trucks just pulling off to the side of the road because they truck driver said well i can make just as much or not if not more sitting at home doing nothing why should i continue working everyone started having that same attitude why work i can make more sitting at home well guess what everybody did <laughs> they went home and we can have the same thing here if we start handing out all the goodies and encouraging people not to work, we'll eventually end up in the same situation. Absolutely. You know, I bought some T-shirts recently. Maybe my assistant can bring one in. I'll show show what it says. There you go. I think we should sell these things. I bought one on Amazon. Both <laughs> Democrat. Incredible. Easier than working. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I think once you get half or, or more than half of the people on the dole, getting the free lunch, sitting at home, you've got an instant, you've got an instant uh, majority that votes in the same people. And what they're doing is voting themselves a raise. Kamala will give them all a nice raise, tickle their ears and tell them how great they are sitting at home, doing nothing. Um, if we get that to that point, I do think that everything grinds to a halt. I mean, I saw, I've seen it firsthand. It's not like it was a hundred years ago. <laughs> this was recent history where you have communism taking over and food lines, clothing lines, all the shelves were empty and people created the underground economy that was 30% of the economy in the former Soviet Union because it was so bad that they had to do something to get goods and services. 
Well, that's we where can head there. With... Maybe that maybe that's where we want to go, Larry. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's where Americans want to be. Well, we saw the admission that that's where Kamala Harris wants to take us with the wage price controls. Absolutely. Yep. And I've said this story yep. before. When I was a young boy, my family was in the pork packing business. We made bacon and ham and stuff like that. They slaughtered 5,000 hogs a day. We were, my family had the biggest independent meat packing pork plant on the East Coast at the time. And Alan Greenspan, during the Nixon years, convinced Nixon to put on a wage price freeze. And he never froze the price that the farmers could sell the hogs to my family's business, but he froze the price of what they could sell to the chain stores and the retailers. And my family essentially went uh, bankrupt over that. Mm -hmm. My dad eventually, with my grandfather and uncle, had to sell the plant only for the physical value of the plant. There was no business left, essentially. And that's what happens. And it creates yeah. a vacuum. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Uh, when were you in the Soviet Union? Well, uh, Paul Weirick and I, uh, the Free Congress Foundation, went over right after the wall, right before the wall came down, and then we went again after the wall came down. And the freedom fighters over there were uh, constantly sending information about the stage and the status of things. And it was uh, it was remarkable. The Kreeble, I think it was the Kreeble Institute was the name of the uh, the foundation. And they were behind uh, the, the wall at that time. Many of the freedom fighters were behind the wall and we, we were supporting them. And it was uh, lots of information coming across and really an incredible, incredibly bad situation that most people have no idea about. And I think there's other examples that are currently going on, Venezuela and others, where we have a situation where we can see clearly what happened. You strangle this incredible engine of democracy, this incredible engine of self-government and, and free markets. And what you end up with is everyone sitting around waiting for the government to hand them something, whatever it is, food, clothing. And if they treat it like everything else, Larry, you know what happens. It's a disaster. Well, and a then the government disaster. ultimately has nothing to hand out as well. <laughs> right. Because there's no producers. All, right. All the producers went home. I, I won't uh, expose uh, this particular business, but I go to a coffee shop uh, frequently and uh, I'm trying to get hook them up with uh, someone that can help them to do business. But you go in there and you look into the case and they just have a few pastries, right? It looks like the former <laughs> Soviet Union because, you know, they're not going to extend themselves today if they don't have the customer base. And people don't want to spend the money going out to restaurants or coffee shops, you know, to the same extent as before, because they got to save their money because they got the price of food, you know, which is up 30, 40 percent, sometimes 50 percent. You've got yeah. gasoline, uh, you know, which is extremely expensive. Uh, you've got insurance, which has gone through the roof, car insurance, housing insurance, uh, medical insurance. Uh, everything is just out of control. And you put these people in power for another four years and we're not going to have anything left, basically. And people don't That's realize, correct. you know, I've been I've been going you know, through, uh, you know, text exchanges with some people that, you know, are confused. Well, I'm going to vote for Kamala Harris. And again, I don't tell people who to vote for. People can figure it out. But I'm going to vote for Kamala Harris because uh, Trump is a misogynist. He's a sexist. You know, this and that. You know, <laughs> he's a racist. OK, OK, vote for him and you won't have anything left for you or your kids. You know, don't I mean, don't vote for him. Who's Kamala Harris? I mean, that's the big question. We know who she is. And you lived in California for a long time, so you've seen her in action uh, or inaction, whatever the case may be. Yeah. And it, it's it's truly frightening. I, I'm afraid, Mike, that uh, if she's elected, that we will be headed into a bloody revolution, ultimately. I don't want to see that. But, um, you know, when things get bad enough, people get desperate. And uh, I'm exactly. also afraid that if Trump is elected, that we'll head into one as well, a civil war, because I think the left knows no bounds. They'll be in the streets. The Black Lives Matter types, the the radical, um, uh, you know, Hamas supporters, uh, which is going to get much worse. You know, we just went through 9-11 and these kids that are supporting Hamas that are protesting, they don't remember 9-11. They don't remember what's going to happen. 
and I want to throw this out too, is that as of today, the prevailing wisdom is after the last debate, I know you didn't watch it, but that Kamala Harris is the favorite to win. Um, I think the so-called October surprise, God forbid, I, I pray this doesn't happen, but I'll bet you anything that we're going to have a terrorist attack in the next 59 days with the people that have been running across the border, some of them terrorists. And the only reason we may not have it is because the terrorists would like Kamala Harris to win. Uh, and uh, because they know that she'd be soft on them, basically, as she's been. And she's been anti-Israel. The only thing she points to in that regard is she has a so-called Jewish husband who's not really Jewish at all. He's a, a member of the Marxian Jewish left, and I don't consider them to be Jewish. You know, I'm messianic. I'm a Jewish Christian. Um, the, the guy is a complete clown. In fact, so much for his ethics and morals. He knocked up his nanny, apparently, when, in a prior marriage and then forced her to have an abortion. This is what we're dealing with. Or yeah. Tim Walsh, you know, who believes in kids getting sex change operations behind the backs of their parents. And then even, you know, signs a bill in Minnesota legislating that. I mean, Minnesota might as well be the Soviet Union, for that matter. So anyway, what's your thoughts on all that? Well, I think you're 100% right on so much of that. I, I'm concerned, too, about the, the born and the unborn uh, children in particular, because I think that they're in, they're in, they're in for some serious uh, trouble. And I'm, and I'm sad to say that I don't think Americans realize what is going on in America currently or, or for some reason between the economy and the perversion you would think that would be enough. There'd be an overwhelming support, even for someone you hated, like Donald Trump. Let's say you really hated him. But if you look at the alternative, we have two choices, Kamala or Donald. And if you can't see that Donald, as much as you might hate him, is a far better situation for the economy and for children, then I, I, I just don't know what to say. It's, it's that people are not engaged. They're not watching. But I do think you're right about about the uh, uh, October surprise. That would be something, and I don't think they're going to wait necessarily. I, I don't think they really care. I think they think that that America is the same to them, and a lot of them, the way they think, is that America and and uh, Donald Trump or Kamala same same devil. And I I don't I don't think they make that distinction. Maybe they do. We'll find out. But I think there's a very severe possibility that we could have a terrorist attack in the very near future. Well, or going across the border. I, I was watching a, a, a movie. I don't uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say the name of it. But one of the things that they had was was bombs being readied to blow up stadiums, uh, all sorts of possibilities. You know, it. we are so lax in our security. Now, we've forgotten about 9-11, we are so lax now that it wouldn't take much. You don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to set up some of these things and some of these terrorist actions. And I, I just don't know, I just don't know how we avoid one as lax as we've been at the border. Yeah, well, that may be the only thing at this point, and not the only thing, but it'll be a thing that would probably push the election to Trump at this point, because it's on Harris's watch, so to speak, and, and her border policies. But the scary thing is, is that most Americans, not, you know, our friends and colleagues and not the supporters of Freedom Watch, but the majority of Americans are not terribly informed. Uh, they're very easily taken by appearance rather than reality. Uh, the other night I did watch the debate. Trump looked very tired. He was very edgy. Uh, he was nervous. He's, he veered off course on a number of issues. Of course, he was attacked by these leftist moderators on ABC uh, who he... He calls the uh, the colleagues of George Slopidopoulos, you might remember. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I got to tell you, I dealt with Sop Slopidopoulos at, at Judicial Watch. He was caught lying. Judge Lambert made a finding that he lied. He was most disrespectful, probably most nasty person I've ever deposed, okay? Um, and ironically, uh, my former wife uh, saw him walking hand in hand with another guy on Capitol Hill, so he's also a liar. He, to the extent that he's married, it may just simply be a beard at this point. <laughs> I saw him years ago, by the way, at the White House Correspondence Dinner. I went with somebody at the time I was single. And uh, 
she was impressed that she had met your Slopidopoulos, Stephan. <laughs> and uh, I turned around. I was talking to a senator from Massachusetts. And she says, hey, here's George Stephanopoulos. And, and Stephanopoulos looks at me and says, oh, it's you. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think I think I remember well, that, that deposition, you. actually. <laughs> you I think that? I was it. Yeah, I do. <laughs> he's a nasty individual, a very nasty, arrogant individual who thinks he's above the law. He genuinely thinks he is. And no one can yeah. touch him. And no one has. I mean, look at look at where he's at. Look at his station. You know, he's he's got the... Uh, what is it? Sunday morning. Uh, of course, I don't even watch any of that anymore. But but uh, yeah, he's in a quite a position to spew his insanity. And, and yeah, he's on every morning. No one. I think it's Good Morning America or whatever it is. Yeah. No, he's he's, he's uh, and he has no talent. I don't know why they have him on there. You know, and he's politics. Not, he's not that good. Politics. Looking. He's got a Napoleonic complex because he's only about five foot two, and. Uh, <laughs> He's basically a dwarf, but other than that, he's a great guy. So <laughs> you're being very generous, Larry. Yeah, I, don't, I don't mean to offend fellow dwarfs, believe me. <laughs> well, yeah, you're insulting them by <laughs> putting nice them in the dwarf. same category. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. They were pretty nice, the seven dwarfs. But in, <laughs> in any event, uh, this is what we're dealing with. And uh yeah. you know, it's 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 out of control and I hope people will go to Freedom Watch and support us because we are your line of defense at freedomwatchusa.org. And Mike knows that we do today at Freedom Watch what we used to do at Judicial Watch, hard-hitting cases, citizens, grand juries, and that kind of thing. We just don't get documents. You know, we, we try to make a difference. And, you know, one of the things that Freedom Watch has been involved in, you don't know much about this, but it's not just political and ideological and government freedom freedom from government, but economic freedom. And so two and a half years ago, uh, making myself the lead plaintiff, the guinea pig, uh, liking golf as you do, uh, and being a fan, I brought an antitrust case in Palm Beach, Florida uh, for golf fan consumers against the PGA Tour and its commissioner, Jay Monahan, the European Tour, which calls itself the DP World Tour, the official golf world ranking, which gives ranking points to players, which allows them to qualify to play in major tournaments, and also Golf Channel that was disparaging this new golf league and its players, the Live Golf League, by calling them takers of blood money, terrorists, everything, because it's simply financed by the Saudi Public Investment Fund. And by the way, Saudi Arabia happens to be one of our top three allies in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And thank God we have them as an ally, not just with regard to oil, but with regard to their support tacitly of Israel, as a matter of fact, they're, they're allies, the two of them. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, you know, it's Iran. So, and they've also modernized, the prince is quite far sighted, uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, and he's turning that into a tourist haven as well in Saudi Arabia, it's doing quite well. But the bottom line is this, is that I filed this case, it was signed to, and you've had experience and you know about judges, Mike, because he used to run the program for Paul Weirich, with regard to you know judicial evaluations, federal ones anyway, it was assigned to a judge in Palm Beach named Luis Delgado. And I thought he was very good, seemed to be very fair. But over time, uh, he slowed the case down, allowed for very little discovery. Uh, documents were produced by Tiger Woods, uh, did everything he could that they wouldn't be made public. These were documents that I had requested dealing with alleged anti-competitive conduct. Uh, and at the time, as this thing progressed, although he slowed everything down, mostly because he's overworked, he's got a thousand cases on his docket. But I think something happened in the interim as well, is that the PGA Tour in Monaghan lost two motions to dismiss, and the case continued on. And he ordered the depositions of uh, Tiger Woods, Roy McElroy, and Davis Love III. At the time this case was fought, I remember the first conference, uh, and I said, Your Honor, I'm going to want to take the deposition of Tiger Woods and Roy McElroy quickly here because they're at the epicenter of what's been going on. He said, who's Roy McElroy? I might have heard of Tiger Woods. So I figured, OK, great. The guy's not going to be you know, prejudiced. But I think what happened over time uh, and in our last hearing, uh, I was joking with him off the record 
where he said he was finally going to get a law clerk because the state judges in, in Florida don't have law clerks. They have to do all the work themselves. And I said, well, Your Honor, I just hope even though you now have a law clerk, you're not tempted to become a federal judge. They get two because I, I think we need people like you on the state court bench. Um, and he said, well, actually, there are no openings right now, <laughs> which told me something. He's looking for a federal judgeship. You know, yeah. The law firms that I'm up against are Sidley and Austin and Skadden Arps. They're huge. They have over 5,000 lawyers between them. And I think he realized that they could block potentially his nomination uh, to the federal court. And he rubber stamped an order that was given to him last Friday, a week ago today, uh, dismissing the case, uh, most of it without prejudice, but uh, you know, throwing a monkey wrench into, into proceeding. And I'm going to be filing in all likelihood a separate complaint to set aside the, the judgment on the basis of fraud because he signed an order, rubber stamped it, that the PGA Tour gave to him, which was fraudulent. I have a hearing uh, this Tuesday. But this is what you go through with judges. So I wanted to point this out, not just because it's an important case, if you're a golf fan, but competition is important in this country. We need competition. We need uh, different alternatives. Like we need uh, new golf leagues. We need new political parties. We need more. We need competition. And whether you like Trump or not, it's, it's unfortunate that we only have two choices in this election. So I wanted to get, you know, your thoughts on, on, on judges in particular, because you've been obviously someone that studied them in the past and, you know, how they are an important part of trying to preserve the Republican democracy and how, unfortunately, uh, they have gone south. They're, they're perhaps, in my opinion, one of the biggest threats uh, to this continued democracy, this American experiment, because they become so politicized, partisan, and otherwise uh, compromised. Well, the selection process is politicized. So you get nothing but politicians as judges. It's not surprising. It's it's the great, the big fundraisers, uh, the people who, uh, the men and women who, who support particular candidates, those are the nominees. And they almost always, so what, what ends up happening is you have a split Senate most of the time. So when the Republicans are from their district, they pick them. The Democrats pick them and no one wants to fight. So no one objects. And so we end up with we end up with with very liberal, mostly very liberal judges, very uh, unrestrained judges who think they can do whatever they want. And they're very politically motivated. They are political animals. They 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 calculate politics into their decisions. Very dangerous. It is, in a sense, what the exactly what happened in the former Soviet Union. You have who had the most money? Who was willing to pay the judge the most? Who was and who was willing to offer the best deal for the judge? That's who won the case. And I think it's very dangerous when a, when a fellow like you who has resources, but not anywhere near the kind of resources of, of a five thousand law firm uh, person goes up against a case, you should get the same exact treatment as that law firm. That's that's the, the ideal thing. You know, yes, we know there's personalities and people get to know each other in the in the clubs you know he, he said he didn't know that much about golf but he learned about golf i guarantee you the next time he went to his club they told him all about R rory mcelroy and and tiger woods and said what are you doing you can't take these guys on they're <laughs> they're icons in the sport yeah he said, oh, I, yeah and so that's what happens it's it's a personality driven politics driven uh judiciary and until we get to a point where we're putting principles first and nominating people who are principled and judicially sound, nothing changes. Nothing changes. And by the way, the Republicans are almost just as bad as the Democrats. It's not like, you know, the Republicans are sterling and they because if, we, if they did, half of our judiciary would be sterling. But it's not. It's not even close. So it tells me that the Republicans are almost as bad as the Democrats. They're about, I don't know, what's this, about a quarter inch better than the Democrats. It's about it. And and so because they all unanimous consent, all these well, nominees. Actually, you've hit the nail on the head because this particular Judge Delgado is a member of the Federalist Society. Mm. And uh, one day, you know, to hear he said, I'm going up to the Federal Society. Are you going up, Larry, <laughs> and the, to the other lawyers? The other lawyer faked it that he was. The guy's a leftist. He supports Kamala Harris and 
AOC. Uh, and but you know you're right. Over time, he began to realize, I believe, that this was not good for his career. That yeah. there would be a firestorm if he ever allowed for the release, the public release of of Tiger Woods's documents. And there's no basis to have classified them as confidential. The PGA Tour in Monaghan stamped virtually every document confidential under protective order, and which creates a lot of time and expense to try to get it removed. And we were about to have a hearing on that right before he dismisses the case. He didn't want to get to that point because he knew he had to make them public. So you are right, Mike. And uh, it finally dawned on him what this could mean for his uh, career if he wanted to be a federal judge, because these other law firms, Sidley and Austin, who I went up against uh, in the AT&T case when I was a Justice Department breaking up AT&T, that was, that was AT&T's lawyer, and Skadden Arps, they're huge and they're very powerful. They can put a monkey wrench with either a Republican administration or a Democrat on the nomination of a federal judge, particularly since these people basically own the American Bar Association, which makes recommendations. And they're nearly all stacked with Democrat lawyers uh, for some reason. So anyway, I just wanted to get into that, but uh, I appreciate your coming on. We'll bring you on again. Uh, you can see just how bright Mike is and articulate, and uh, he's been our one of our citizens' judges, <laughs> the only citizens' judge so far in our cases, and we'll bring him back because he is a very fair person as well, although he has obviously his, his views on things like everybody does, but all judges do, and their role is to remove uh, you know, their their background and their feelings from a case. And Mike does that. So in any event, uh, thanks, Mike. Have a great weekend. And we'll be back. And I hope people will go to freedomwatchusa.org, contribute with tax-deductible contributions. Where you're a real Justice Department. You have no Justice Department. What you've got is a Gestapo run by Merrick Garland and Christopher Wray, Attorney General and head of the FBI. Out of control people with a political agenda they not only want to crush President Trump, but they want to crush you as well if you disagree with what they believe in. Thank you, Mike. God bless you. God bless you, and thanks thanks for having me on, Larry. It's always great to join you. My, my honor and pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.